Hello, and welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we will continue our discussion on Sabrina and Karina by Kali Fajardo Anstey. Last episode, we continued our discussion on Sabrina and Karina, focusing on the first half of the collection featuring Sugar Babies, Sabrina and Karina, Sisters, Remedies, and Julian Plaza. This episode, we will continue the discussion with Galapago, Cheeseman Park, Tommy, Any Further West, All Her Names, and Ghost Sickness. Uh, well, I hope you all are enjoying um, this book as much as we are. And uh, we, um, so we do have most of the stories to get through. So, you know, let's, let's just jump right in. Uh, there's so many passages that we wanted to talk about mm. and only so much time. Um, so the first one that we left off with was uh, Yalapago. And I don't know about you all, but, the, you know, that first line, um, the day before Perla at Ortiz killed the man, she had lunch at home with her granddaughter, Alana. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, I, I, I've seen this kind of as a signature of, of Gali's writing style that she has like these sharp contrasts, you know, of like really dark images and also suspenseful, you know, because it does bring up like what happened, right? Mm -hmm. And then like... Um, you know, something nice, like a nice little image, you know, yeah. especially this paragraph where at the bottom uh, she mentions the she, um, you know, that she's watching Judy Garland and uh, that she preferred her usual flour tortillas with beans and rice. You know, so it's the, like this really nice um, meal, you know. Um, but, of course, you also wonder, well, you know, what happened, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so it's one of those uh, it comes from the school of great great first lines that makes you want to continue as a reader because there's a, a a mystery to unfold like how do we get to this point exactly and because it, it's such a sharp contrast you know like her killing someone and then like it's this beautiful little scene of you know Judy Garland and and you know Flower Tortillas mm -hmm. um I also had the, I don't know if you also had the the next page that follows um, where um, it, it um, 106 um, th towards the bottom where um, the narrator tells us, uh, managing household grief became another task as endless as chores. Aved sometimes cried beneath the fork apple tree in the backyard and, and to hide his sorrow from Alana. Uh, Perla would close the windows and turn up the country music station, drowning out everything with a twang. Now, 30 years later, Perla wondered if she would have let Elena hear him cry. Um, <clears throat> you know, just again, um, really interesting juxtaposition of, um, you know, how people suffer and sometimes, um, you know, the, there's a literal muting of, of suffering here mm -hmm. with just blasting, you know, country music of all things, right? Um, and, um, you know, that it, it just, it's added to the list, you know, grief itself becomes another thing on the shopping list, it seems, because it's just another chore to them. And it kind of, you know, in the whole collection, um, <clears throat> it's simply something that I saw as we talked about as a theme, right, of, of suffering as just commonplace. Mm -hmm. And because of, of the communities, you know, that are suffering from different kinds of oppression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, you know, right from the very beginning with this story, I was hooked on just the, the beauty of and the beautiful juxtaposition of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. What else did you guys find interesting from this one? I liked how, oh, again, it ties into all of the same themes that we've been just talking about. Yeah. Um, but it also ties into the other stories. So I, on page 114, I don't know if you have something before then. I just had a, a brief one on, oh. on 110. Um, uh, you know, uh, I like I said, I kind of gravitate towards the, the darker passages and so this was, um, you know, um, a flash forward, you know, uh, it, where it says, um, 
Within a decade, both Miguel and Mercedes would be dead. She of hepatitis and Miguel of AIDS. But the shower was beautiful. The four of them devoured far too many tamales and slices of their delicious cake. The party going on until after midnight as they shared family stories and their aspirations for the baby inside Mercedes. Uh, <clears throat> so wow. once again, right? I mean, that yeah. just... The juxtaposition it's like a matryoshka doll of realities there yeah of, of uh considering realities yeah um you know and uh, uh the, i i i like that imagery of you know the the baby shower with the three leshes and the tamales you know the one too many tamales um you know with the tragedy of these kinds of um what i kind of consider, you know, what we all see as like, consider in society as like silent killers, you know, hepatitis and AIDS. Yeah. And especially, of course, if one doesn't have the health care for it, you know, which we had talked about it's last really, time. really prevalent in um, lower income neighborhoods, which are, which are often people of color, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of plays in. And, and so it reminds me a lot of, of, you know, hanging out and when we have events here, you know, quinceañeras and mm -hmm. parties and, um, yeah yeah and, and and miguel himself you know is gay you know so that's the connection there to aids is how um going back to the reagan administration you know um there was a lot of um uh oppression against the gay community and so they suffered a lot because there was a lot of uh, denial and misinformation you know when it came to, when it come when it came to like aids treatment and how you know they could actually be helped and and um you know of course now it's it's a much more treatable um uh, syndrome uh, but you know back then of course it was far more deadly um just like hepatitis was back then you know that um what i know actually from my family's history that um they didn't screen for it in the 1980s so and not until recently do people actually screen for those kinds of things when like you have a baby or something like that so um but you know i also just like those two because of the food you know and mm -hmm. tamales tortillas and the leches you I know, know those <laughs> yeah i'm familiar <laughs> yeah um but anyway um so vanessa you said you had um uh, one that ties into the other stories yes so on page 114 um the second to last paragraph on that page mm -hmm. um so they're standing in a cemetery mm -hmm. and i'm just going to read the paragraph real quick yeah from a distance the section of the cemetery where mercedes mercedes was buried seemed like an empty field it was only standing directly above the graves that Perla could read any of the names. Destiny Dixon, Sabrina Cordova, Susanna Mullins, and there, toward a chain link fence beside the train tracks, Mercedes and Angelica Ortiz. Perla loathed sta standing over graves, worried she was stepping on a face or a chest. Maybe it was because when she was a little girl, a priest had once told her that hell was really just a grave. Um, so I really liked this paragraph because it ties back into Sabrina and Karina. Mm -hmm. um, and the it talks about how the different plots, I guess, are almost kind of segregated. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that yeah. was like really important that we should touch on. Yeah. What do you, so and it's something we've seen before, right? Um there is an you know one thing that ties this collection together is like mm -hmm. the we see recurring characters in different ways you know yeah. here it's just yeah. the grave another you know a, a character is mentioned like um you know um dodi right mm -hmm. um so i i thought you know that was a really nice touch you know it's it's not completely overlapping it, it seems Faulknerian to me you know, because mm -hmm. Faulkner was big on, on like creating that universe where, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, you have um, Yaknapatapa County and the, the same characters that are in different uh, in in different roles mm -hmm. uh, in the stories. Yeah, I mean, it becomes this really comprehensive uh, 
world building that as you mm -hmm. read and, and, and each story and continue continue to read them, you know, you, you start to build these characters and imagine them and in the in situations and um, she just uh, does such a great job of making these characters seem real mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you could go down to these places and see them and, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it definitely makes these stories come alive. Uh, and ironically, by, you know, being in a, in a cemetery, um, I, and the reason, you know, her being here, um, so there, so this is a story about a break-in and it, this story really emphasizes, um, that break-ins were very common in this area. Um, and then the passage I had was on the next page. Uh, I just had one more comment. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to mention that I really like this, this, the way that they mentioned Sabrina in this story, mm -hmm. because it's super brief. Um, and it's kind of like how you see people every day, like in, mm. just in passing, mm -hmm. like you don't know their story. Mm -hmm. But in this book, we are able to see Sabrina's story. And so it's kind of, I saw it as more like everybody has a story and like you have to be able to listen to other people's stories. Right on. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and it kind of, um, remember how we had talked about last episode that there was a, that she was added to the list of names that there was that passage, mm -hmm. you know, where, um, Karina of course wanted to, um, to fight that, but, um, you know, nonetheless, you know, it goes back to that idea of like the, the, the femicides and, mm -hmm. um, you know, just another woman, right. That the, the, the neighborhood just sees as, um, you know, another victim, mm -hmm. you know, and it, so it's kind of interesting in that regard, you know, cause she's the second name from this list, right. So she's kind of sandwiched in between these other women mm -hmm. and, um, and, and 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 I it kind of reminds me also I don't know if you remember Richie the, the with uh, Dr. Gopal the concept of of midrash. Midrash, yeah. You knew exactly what he was talking about. <laughs> You're like, yes, <laughs> yeah. absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's just um, <clears throat> Jewish practice of kind of interpreting texts, right? The books, the teachings, um, and, and kind of applying the contemporary kind of outlook to it mm -hmm. like the idea that a story is never complete mm -hmm. and so you're always, always being added to you're it. adding to it you know right. whether it's a counter narrative or just supplemental stuff uh for a more complete picture of what that person was really like or that history or whatever mm -hmm. um was there anything else about that no that was my last comment <laughs> okay. on that one okay um so the one that i had was just on the at the end of that section where it mentions uh, Perla went quiet then. She wondered about Cody. So Cody here is the, um, the one who she ended up shooting that we saw from the very first line. That was the man. Uh, was his body in a cemetery? Was it near freeway or train tracks? Did he have at the very least some flowers? Even plastic would do. Um, I, I like this one just because it does bring to mind, you know, um, of course, you know, he ended up breaking in, um, but um, just the idea that like even, you know, to a burglar that um, it's kind of, well, you know, um, what what ends up happening and uh, the idea of like, how is it that um, you, you deal with uh, the dead and, um, you know, kind of I, I like that touch about you know even plastic flowers would do mm -hmm. you know um that they don't have to be there doesn't have to be an authenticity behind it for it to mean something um which i think is you know kind of goes to like human dignity um that everyone deserves human dignity mm. um and that's what um what she's placing as well like she's placing uh plastic uh, marigolds um, but um, uh, in uh, in a red uh, headstone. Did you have another one from this one? Um, the last paragraph, I really liked. What was it? On page, page one eighteen. 
Okay. Um, so I really liked how this ended because it does start off with like that dark imagery. Mm-hmm. But at the end, it's talking about how the room is flooded with light. And so I kind of saw that as like a metaphor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Did you want to I read? wanted to explain it. Oh. <laughs> I was like trying to figure out how to explain <laughs> it. Um, so the story behind this scene, I guess, is after the first time the house is broken into, they board up all of the windows. Well, the bedroom window. Um so there's no light in there. Mm-hmm. Um, it says 40 years. So that's a long time yeah. to have your bedroom just completely blocked off from the light. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did you have something to say about that? No, one? yeah, I, I marked that one as well. It's a strong image. Absolutely. You know, in a, in a book filled with trauma, despair, mm. death, mm, it's important to be able to, you know, read signs, mm-hmm. right? Images. And so this, this glint of light, it's this, this hope in the darkness right. that mm-hmm. I think is, is necessary, mm-hmm. right? For us to continue moving onward. So it's, it's just um, important image imagery that I think uh, Kylie weaves throughout her books. You know, these little mm-hmm. moments that, you know, we don't want to be completely cynical mm-hmm. about, about this, but... Yeah, that's what I like about her writing is mm-hmm. it's it's very subtle and yeah. and um, um, this particular image reminds me. I don't know if you if y'all have been to the to the Holocaust Museum here, mm-hmm. um, but you know I have my students go as for one of their essays and um, um, you know once you get through the the Holocaust um, area of, of the exhibit, um, it finishes with like. The, the white with you know, white walls and white light coming in, you know, from the sun. And um, um, so it's that same idea, right? That like there, there is hope uh, in the dark amongst mm-hmm. the darkness, mm-hmm. you know? And um, so, yeah, you know, it, and I guess also the idea that it's, you know, 40 years, like you said, right. Yeah. It's a long time and, you know, a lifetime in some ways almost. And that, um, Sometimes because it is intergenerational, right? I mean, that's how long it takes mm-hmm. for us to cleanse ourselves and, and the, for the healing to finally come in right through the bedroom, which, you know, is such an important room in any household. Um, so that's uh, Galapago. Yes. Um, the next one, uh, uh, Cheeseman Park. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you all think about this one? What? Um, there is so much I had so many from this one yeah I think my first one's on page 121 okay so I like the very last line on that page um it says it's the mother talking to her daughter Mm -hmm. and she says make sure you find something to do something to be proud of you've got to stop thinking about it and I really really love that line because I think a lot of times even myself I stop myself from doing things because I overthink them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even if it's something that I'm like completely passionate about, yeah. I'll just overthink it and be like, I can't do oh. it. So mm-hmm. I think that this is like a really strong line. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, do you mean, is it because of um, uh, imposter syndrome? Like the idea that like you don't feel you're up to it or is it because of like uh, another kind of hesitation? I think a lot of the times in my case, it's more of, what if I'm no good at it? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. So self doubt and. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. But I think, especially like doing this, like the podcast, I think I'm pushing myself to start doing these things, and I'm like, not hesitant towards doing things that I want to better, especially like this community here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it goes back, you know, to our first book. You know, of like um, speaking up and sharing your voice mm. and not being afraid to like step up to the mic, you know, which all, all three of us have been doing in different ways. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, okay. Um, I had one on, on 125. I don't know if you had another one before that. Um, on 124, I guess. Yeah. There's, I guess, the second paragraph in the second section of that page. 
they're talking about her getting a job. Mm-hmm. And her mom says, well, her mom, it says, mother insist- my mother insisted that working wasn't only about money. It was about structure, purpose, keeping track of days. And I think that's really interesting because it definitely is that all of that. It helps you, like, different days, you do different things. And so it it does provide that structure and the days don't all blend into one another, mm-hmm, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, kind of that idea of um, adulting, you know, and the... Um, um, the, the like, you know, ac- academia can help because it does, like, you, you you know what's coming. You know, you have a syllabus mm-hmm. and a calendar, right. you know, a calendar of events, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, um, and sometimes, like, that's what people need, you know. Some structure. Structure. Yeah. Um, motivation, you know. Um, and uh, this is a... So this is a I'm trying to remember the context here. Um, so she's talking with her mom, and uh, on the on the next page, um, I uh, um, I liked um, the uh, cheese kind of a little background onto uh, mm-hmm. Cheeseman, mm-hmm. um, if, if that's how it's pronounced. I'm not sure. I think it is. Um, and so um, at the middle of the page, it reads, she lowered her sunglasses and glanced around. Cheeseman used to be a symmetry. Did you know that? No, I said, shaking my head. Look around, the land is uneven. The headstones were moved, but hundreds, maybe thousands of bodies were left behind. Mostly the poor, people without family, that kind of thing. They say it's haunted. Um, and then at the bottom, it just says, um, you know, um, my family's from Colorado, more generations that I can count. Me too, on my mom's side, but my dad was from Detroit. Uh, then you know a lot about death and decay, she laughed. You know, so there's this, um, um, again, going back to like what we just talked about with uh, her, with Perla visiting the graveyard and here, uh, the idea that Cheeseman used to be one itself and that because they were poor, simply, you know, they just ended up being displaced from all that, right? And um, there's a lot of Gothic stories that are like that, where, you know, used to be a sacred place, mm. you know, whether it's uh, The Shining or, or uh, Poltergeist. Mm. Um, and just because of, uh, of capitalism, basically, they end up being moved, you know, and, and so there's something, of course, sacrilegious about, sacrilegious about that. And, um, you know, um, the, the idea that like, um, there, there's, I mean, there's that kind of ghostliness to it, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the darkness, um, but it's kind of funny that, you know, they just kind of laugh about it. And it's one way of course, of like dealing with those kinds of things, you know, is all you can do is laugh sometimes. In some sense, you know, because we were left, uh, like, it's it's futile, right? Like, there's nothing you can do about it yeah. at that point. I think of, a, was it Watchmen? <laughs> and the comedian? What do you say? Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you, you read the novel, right? Yeah, yeah. Did you ever read Watchmen? It's kind of, maybe it's not as far off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this part out. It doesn't really fit. <laughs> but, like, he would think, you know, that's what life is. You know, it was a big joke. Oh, that's yeah. That's why he chose the name Comedian. yeah. But. Yeah, I remember he also comments on like the American Dream and all. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there, was there another passage you like from this one, um, Vanessa? Yes, on page 136. They're sitting in a bar, and it's Monica and um, Liz. Mm-hmm. And Liz thinks to herself, I could be anyone, I thought. And she would still say these things. Monica didn't want help or comfort, she wanted to be seen. And I think that also ties into, like, Sabrina and Karina. Mm -hmm. Um, And, like, the want for attention to just be seen. Or to be even just validated, you know, like, for who you are. um, Not be judged. Um, To the readers, could you explain, um, or listeners, (laughs) could you explain um, Monica and, and Liz's relationship? 
Liz is just coming back to Colorado mm -hmm. um, from, I believe it's L.A. Mm -hmm. And she moves in with her mom. And Monica is their downstairs neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so they start hanging out. And Liz mentions that she wants a job. And so Monica tells her, oh, you can help me clean out my apartment. I'm getting rid of my late husband's things, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um and so Liz goes over and they start talking and they start to get to know each other and they decide to go out. And that's kind of how this scene comes into. Story. Okay. You said it reminded you of Sabrina and Karina, but what about for Monica herself? Like, um, why do you think it's important for her to be seen? I think because she's still so young mm -hmm. um, and she's already lost her husband. Mm -hmm. I think... She's question, questioning her own life. Mm -hmm. And I think, I forgot to mention this, but the way that they meet, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. the way that they meet is um, Liz goes up to the roof and Monica's sitting there on the ledge. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah. Right? So Yeah, she's suicidal. Yes. She's about to, like... Jump off. She's contemplating jumping off the uh -huh. building. Yeah. So I feel like that definitely is why. Yeah. Uh, and once again, like the 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 pearls of of grief, you know, and um, trauma, and uh, loss, you know, um, mm -hmm. and uh, also um, catharsis, you know, because uh, at the end, I don't know if you re if you all remember, but. Um, uh, there's a homeless man that they've mm -hmm. seen, you know, <clears throat> that lives in the, mm -hmm. well, uh, you know, is in from the area. And then, um, you know, um, Monica just kind of loses it, you know, uh, because um, he happens to be wearing what she thinks is like um, uh, her husband's jacket, mm -hmm. you know. And so, of course, you know, she's unable to control her reaction and uh, it's uh, Liz who, you know, ends up trying to stop her from, you know, hurting him. But, um, you know, he, he, he ends up pretty bloodied up from that. Um, and so it's just kind of that idea that, of course, the homeless man is innocent, right? You know, he, he's homeless and he's needy. Um, but just... The idea, you know, that, of course, Monica is in over, over that trauma yet. Mm. Um, yeah, so, and it kind of ends, you know, with um, the emphasis on, on eyes. You know, um, this is uh, the in the last couple pages where uh, it says, I've been looking at some photos of myself, she said, and talking to her mother. Uh, mostly when I was with your father, I'm a little embarrassed. And her mother says, I can tell how sad I look. It's something in my eyes. There's this dull light inside them. I'm starting to wonder if it's always been there. If I looked that way before your father when I was a teenager or even a little girl. And then um, Liz says, you just have dark eyes. Plenty of people do. I, I know I do. And then she says, no, it's different. What happened to me that made me look so sad? You know, and... Um, We've talked a lot about uh, photos in this mm -hmm. podcast, you know, and um, it's just another way that um, people interpret, you know, visuals and whether they're looking happy or beautiful or whether in this case, you know, she <clears throat> sees, she, you know, she's trying to remember something mm -hmm. that made her look that way, you know, and some something traumatic. So, yeah, that's that's Cheeseman, Cheeseman Park. Um Tommy is the next one, and um, that's my uh, personal favorite from this whole collection. Mm -hmm. um, so in a nutshell, it's basically about um, this, uh, our narrator, um, who is Nicole, but she goes by Cole, who um, uh, was at a correctional uh, facility in Pueblo, Colorado. And, um, you know, one of the things that we end up finding out is that you know, um, her family never ended up visiting, you know, and so I really like how um, 
it's about um, how our people are sometimes left behind in the in our in our prison system, mm-hmm. and you know uh, a lot of resentment comes after they're freed. You know that is of course natural to feel that way, and kind of the way that the prison system just kind of breeds more um, insularity. You know, mm-hmm. like uh, in other words, a disconnect from the outside world. You know, once we try to integrate them back. And the difficulty that comes for that, mm. and so she ends up living with um, with her brother Manny, and um, um, Manny has um, a boy who's you know basically um, Cole's nephew, uh, Tommy, and um, uh, Tommy is also um, you know the the title of the story and. Um, um, what I liked about this one is kind of how, you know, she gets to know Tommy and basically becomes like a surrogate mother to him to and um, shows him like <clears throat> a little bit about herself, like, mm. you know, her history and um, also kind of acts as a literacy sponsor, which we've talked about before, mm-hmm. you know, and um, uh, so I um, and, you know, she there's a moment where they're at the library and she loses him because uh, he kind of just runs off, you know, so it's not her fault. Um, but, you know, uh, she ends up in, in Natalie, who is her mom, Natalie's home. And uh, Natalie just kind of, you know, unloads on, on, on Cole for being, well, how could you lose, you know, my son and all these kinds of things that make her feel so guilty about who she is and uh you know because she's still kind of traumatized from you know being disconnected from her family and being having served in the correctional facility you know um and and i have a passage on 160 161 i don't know if you had one before that um just a small one it's on page 149 yeah um so the house that they're living in um cole and Manny Mm -hmm. belonged to their parents. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, So in a conversation with Tommy and Cole, he asks her, Hey, Cole, which room was yours growing up? Was it mine or the other room? The big room with with the bathroom connected. And then she talks about the history of like the master bedroom. And she says... He was talking about the master bedroom, where my father had collapsed in the shower. It was also where my mother fell asleep when I was eight years old and never woke up. No one stayed in that room anymore. There were too many ghosts. Mm. So I like that they have, like, this is a common theme in a lot of the stories also. Mm -hmm. Like, that house has been in the family forever. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's kind of similar, because I, (laughs) the house that I live in Mm. was my great-grandparents' house. Mm. So wow. similar yeah. <laughs> in a sense. So I thought that that was really interesting, like the stories behind each room. Yeah. And in particular, I mean, this is a, this is pretty dark, right? And mm-hmm. a reason why, you know, the, mentions are right. There were too many ghosts, like you said. And, mm-hmm. and uh, <clears throat> I, you know, again, it just reminds me, like I said, la- last episode of A Haunting of Hill House and uh, the dark histories that, you know, th- th- these stories tell um it's you know it makes it like a a, you know a gothic collection you know even though like it you know it's not like 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 you know outright supernatural of course right but there's a there's that subtle gothic element that um again ironically just kind of makes you feel like you know there's something there right like um that is affecting the characters in some way. Um, you know, in the case of of, um, of Cole, you know, just having to serve time and um, having to deal with, like, the repercussions of, like, how is she going to be able to be accepted back, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's something that I think is part of the motivation for her to um, help Tommy. Mm. Um so yeah, that that was that was that was an interesting one. Yeah. You know, those little details again that 
uh, Kali throws in there, right? That yeah. if you if you miss him, you know, yeah. Um, was there another one beyond be, be that one? Um, no, no. I think mine's more of like an overall main component, I guess. Okay. So I'll wait until after you're done. <laughs> yeah. So uh, um, my last one was on uh, one one sixty one. Um, you know, so this is after what I said that what happened uh, with Natalie, you know, giving her a tongue gnashing. And, um, you know, um, so she, um, they're, they're back with Manny. And, um, you know, uh, Cole is really down. And she says, uh, I think there's something wrong with me. And then, you know, Manny just kind of trying to uh, be funny. He says, your reflexes could use some help the next time. You know, because uh, Natalie punched her out. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, she says, no, like a person. I couldn't hold back from crying. Tears flowed down my nose, salting my split lip. I always screw up. I always hurt my family. Manny looked around, searching for napkins, finding none. With quick fingers, he unbuttoned his flannel, placed it in my hands. Wipe off your face. There's nothing wrong with you. And there never was. It's just a really uh, brief moment, mm -hmm. you know, but it's very cathartic for how this relationship is is brought to back together, mm -hmm. you know, is um, her being vulnerable and Manny, you know, validating her identity as, you know, um, the fact that there is nothing wrong, you know, and I think, you know, that guiltiness comes from not just with Natalie, you know, of course, but um, the fact that she was serving time and, and um, you know, people, the idea, of course, that, yes, you know, people make mistakes, you know, but you can't just judge their entire history, their entire life based on one single mistake, you know. And um, uh, so I, I, I thought that was a, a really nice mm -hmm, passage. Mm -hmm. And it ends, you know, with, um, um, you know, uh, reconnecting back with Tommy uh, because, um, you know, uh, she goes she goes to sleep. Um, and then it says, um, not long after, someone opened the basement door, which is where she was. They walked quickly without switching on the lights. And I knew that it was Tommy. He sat on the edge of the futon near my feet. He said nothing and I didn't need him to. It was a sens sensation I used to get as a child, the feeling of someone you love resting at the foot of your bed after they've told the story when there's nothing left to say. Just another beautiful passage about, um, you know, how, again, uh, it, it's an intimate no moment between her and Tommy that shows that the bond that they've developed, you know, after she's inculcated in her, in him, uh, a desire to, you know, read books and it's something that she points out as a point of pride from her prison, right? That, you know, Tommy kind of is incredulous about her reading. Uh, and she says, well, I was in prison. What do you think I did, you know, all, all my time, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I just thought, again, um, very subtle, you know, but um, super um, beautiful way of, of just look um reconciling you know just about everything you know that how she felt what happened with natalie losing him um and you know that's sometimes that, that's all it takes you know it's um kind of how kali zooms out of this moment you know that it's a, the sensation you know that brings back her memories of when she was um a, a child so any further west is up next, and um, uh, Venice. I think I you had said this one was your favorite from the collection. I keep changing it. I think every episode <laughs> I've said it's a different one. Right. <laughs> um, yes, I really like this one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, on the first page of this one, also it also mentions Cordoba. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to mm -hmm. that yeah. whole thing. It does. Um, so what do we have in this one? We have a mother and a daughter, mm -hmm. and they go, they move from Colorado to California. And um, then they meet um, 
well, they end up renting right and um, yes. uh, with um, and then they end up meeting the landlord who is Casey. Yes. Um, and so Casey becomes more than a landlord, uh, right? Because um, she ends up he, he ends up getting involved uh, with her mother. Her mother. Mm -hmm. What else did you like about this one? I liked. Um, <clears throat> I think just the overall story and um, seeing the daughter begin to understand who her mom is. Mm. Um, I thought it was interesting that she got involved with Casey, Kathy. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you say it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Casey, but yeah. Either one, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that that relationship is really interesting. I on page one sixty nine. Um. It kind of describes Casey um, and kind of where the relationship between him and her mom starts to change. And then she mentions, when he returned, he would shower and then knock on our door where he flirted with my mother leaning against our doorframe, the sky behind him blistering wh blisteringly white. By mid-October, he cut us a deal on rent and by November, there was no rent to pay at all. And I think it goes back to the whole idea of these women are just trying to survive. Mm. Um, and they're doing what they can to be able to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Casey himself, right, in, in that passage, you know, we find out he, he doesn't even work, right? So kind of uh, the lifestyle of this kind of, of many kind of landlords is, you know, they just collect checks, right? And mm -hmm. um so we find out that, you know, um, his parents have these properties, right? And um, that he, he, you know, he's now inherited. And um, so it's it's kind of like he doesn't, he, you know, he doesn't even need the money anyway, you know? And um, he also, his his skills aren't, you know, he uh, the narrator mentions like he could, he could barely fix our drains, you know, when they clog with ropes of black hair. Um, so it's it's just kind of another way that many of these women uh, in this in our collection have been, like you said, right, they're just surviving. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, there's also um, um, the, the, the men that, you know, have more power over them in some way. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's money in this case or... Um, just brute force and uh, forget the, I think it was um, uh, uh, Sisters where th there was a, a character that ended up getting assaulted. Hmm. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, I think even in um, Cheeseman Park, that's why she moves back in with her. She leaves California to go back with her mom. Cheeseman oh. Park. Oh, yeah. And she has like a black eye. Yeah. It's like that same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, did you have another one from this one? I have one on 176. Um, mine was just on 175. Um, it's the charm bracelet. Yeah. I thought that that was really... The story behind the charm bracelet I thought was oh. really cute. Yeah. But at the same time, it's a little... Not creepy. I guess morbid? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so her mom gives her a charm bracelet and there's three charms, a baby rattle, a chicken and a locket. Mm -hmm. And so they talk about the locket and what's inside of it. Mm -hmm. And so she says, the mom is talking to Neva and she says, when you were two, you came down with this bad fever. You were so hot that I could barely touch you. My my mother opened the locket, revealing two tufts of dark hair. Grandma said you'd die if we didn't bring it down. I gave you cold baths. You didn't cry at all. You just sat in the tub, shivering. I prayed all night, and in the morning, just like that, you were better. Calm and smiling, and the right temperature. So you know what I did? No, I said. I can't remember. My mother kissed my head. I cut off a piece of your hair. Fever hair, I called it. I put it in this locket with a piece of my own hair. I don't know why, but it makes me happy to have us together like that. And so I thought that was really interesting of keeping that as the memory 
was their hair. Which is also another big, um, I think, symbol in a lot of these stories is hair. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had just read that the passage about, you know, the um, in passing it mentions that, you know, that the, the drains were clogged with that dark mm-hmm. hair. Right. You know, and so um, <clears throat> here it becomes a, a symbol for, you know, the, the, the unity between them, mm-hmm. right? Mother and daughter. And um, I also like, I had the same passage and... Oh. <laughs> um, I had the that last paragraph where it says, I felt the weight of the bracelet on my wrist. I thought of how strange it would be to touch someone so hot with fever you could barely hold them. I had never felt something like that. And I wondered if I ever, ever would. Uh, so the power of touch and, um, you know, um, th- how you, you know, in this case, because of a fever, like, you know, you want to hold them right, but they're just like, you know, so hot that. Um, but, um, you know, that the. And just kind of also just like with, um, you know, the was it um, what's the story where the, the grandmother passed down the herbal remedies? Remedies. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Um, where here, you know, she passes this down, mm. you know, and, uh, so there, there's a lot of that in this collection of passing things down, whether mm-hmm. it's property or, or in this, you know, or just, uh, different, um, uh, uh, keepsakes, you right, know, yeah. that have these memories in them. Was there another one that you wanted to highlight from this? Yes. So, um, it's the last paragraph mm-hmm. of the story um and going back to like what i had said earlier about how she's under like understanding who her mom is mm-hmm. i think this is when she comes to i guess somewhat of a conclusion yeah and she says that's when i knew she was forever caught in her own undercurrent bouncing from one deep swell to the next she would never lift me out of the sea of that sea she would never pause to fill her lungs with air she would soon the world would yank her chain of sadness against every shore, every rock, every glass filled beach, leaving nothing but the broken hull of a drowned woman. And so, again, I think that ties back into the whole idea of her just trying to survive. Mm-hmm. But I think that comparison of like the ocean to mm-hmm. the whole thing um, is very symbolic. And like, like, so she's trying to survive. Mm-hmm. And it also gives you the symbol of like she's drowning. And so she's, like, asking for help, but she's not asking for help, I guess, in the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had this passage, too. um, And uh, I I did like that symbolism a lot, too. The imagery, Mm -hmm. you know, the the, the helplessness, right, that she has. That It's also, like, it says, like, her own undercurrent, Mm -hmm. you know, and and that she's kind of just bouncing around, you know. So the lack of stability also. Mm -hmm that we see mm-hmm. um uh w- yeah so i that that, that 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 just like that imagery just really struck me um yeah. and um that you're kind of just floating right and you know you have no agency mm. um so that was any further west and then uh, the next one was All Her Names. Yes. Um, so what was this one? This one is about Alicia. Yeah. And her relationship with, um, I guess, her lover, mm-hmm. Michael. Um, so Alicia is married to Gary. But when Gary goes out of town, she's with Michael. Uh, one of the things that struck me about this one, um, and it's a very small passage, but it deals again with, you know, I, I really like the passages that emphasize a little background about the land, the mm-hmm. landscape. And we talked about this since episode one. Um, so I had one on, on 183. I, I feel like I keep doing this mind on 182. <laughs> oh, okay. Go, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> so in that first paragraph of that, um, second section mm-hmm. towards the bottom of the page. Mm-hmm. Um, it says, 
they so they go to it's um Michael and Alice and they go to a Mexican restaurant mm. and it talks about the people that are there. And so it says, it was packed with a few Mex- Mexicano families, several Chicano rockabilly couples, and of course a sm- smad smattering smattering S- smattering yeah. Smattering? A smattering of Anglo newcomers, white kids in Carhartt hoodies and red wing shoes, the clothing of a work they'd never know. And I thought that that was a really strong line because they're just using it as like their everyday, like this is so that I can look cool. Mm. But it's like very much tied to, I guess, construction and like a specific type of work. Hmm. The, 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 so those are... Uh brands right yes uh, or so are those like particular expensive brands or what mm, i don't think so hmm. but i'm also not sure yeah so in other words then um or so it's kind of like um what's it called like um wearing clothes that just like doesn't speak to your identity yeah 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 i think so hmm. Um, and it's a kind of interesting collection of people, right? You know, um, mm-hmm. kind of shows again the diversity of, um, in this case, um, the the restaurant, the Botanica del Cobre, and um, this is a. Uh, I'm trying to remember if it's Saguarita, the setting for this one. It um, is. I think yeah, I think it's Denver. Okay. Right? It says on one eighty two at the bottom of the page. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that that people from Denver are moving in, and um, um, so it a lot of the stories also discuss kind of the I, I had already mentioned whether it's dead bodies that are displaced or people that are displaced because of gentrification, and uh, before that passage, though, I had the the following page where, um. You know, just a couple of things like uh, it mentions it had been over a decade, she thought, since he first visited the Botanica. Alicia's father was dying of liver cancer brought on by years of working the uranium mines outside of outside Denver. The doctors prescribed morphine, oxycontin, fentanyl patches. Um, nothing masked his anagony without shutting down his brain. It just, um, you know, another way of of uh thinking about the suffering that the people here right uh go through where um in this case uh her father you know because of environmental injustice uh there's a lot of history behind uranium mines and and indigenous communities and and whether it's colorado or new mexico uh as well prominently um, and in some cases, it's about dumping nuclear waste in these communities. Uh, and so there's that. And then what I also liked about this pa- this passage is um, the, the remedy for it. You know, we've talked about herbal remedies mm-hmm. here. These are like, you know, uh, Western, this is Western medicine here that shuts down the brain. You know, so these are like narcotics and it just, um, it you know, it, of course, it, you know, the, the problem with that is like you get addiction and, and um, you know, uh, sub- substance abuse, things like that. And ultimately, you know, the, the point here that our narrator makes is that, you know, it, it doesn't like it, it, you're not, you're no longer serving, you're no longer functioning in a, in a way where you're like, that's really you, you know, because you're whatever is in the, the, the way that it's affecting your brain, you know, just kind of uh, numbs you right to the pain mm-hmm. instead of actually healing you. Um, so I thought that that was a nice touch. Um, and then, um, you know, these, those are nice touches where at the bottom it says, the intro to Botanica to the ringing of bells, a banana rind tied, tied around the brass doorknob, protection or warning, either way, some kind of brujeria. Um, so the, the, the setting, right, of the Botanica mm-hmm. itself. Um, I, and then I had um, a little later on 185, uh, 
just uh, I had mentioned the the setting uh, of these stories, and uh, in this one, uh, mm -hmm. so they um, they're in the Nova, the car, and uh, in um, part of the the narration here it says. Um, so Denver, Denver was founded when an Anglo named uh, William Greensbury Russell discovered gold in the city erupted. Before that, it was in an Arapaho camp. Now it was a desolate hillside filled with stoners and the homeless, flanked by multi-million dollar condos and public art. The new Queen City of the Plains. Um, so, you know, just the idea of like um, gentrification, you know, that and again, displacement, you know, it was an indigenous community and because of the, the founding of and gold, basically the gold rush, it just became, um, you know, just, uh, again, a heavily gentrified area. Um, but uh, so that's, um, that's that. But was there another passage from this one that you really wanted um, to? Yeah, well, there was two, but I guess... The first one goes back to the whole remedies. Um, so it says, it's um, Abuela Lopez talking to Alicia. Mm -hmm. And she says, before all this bullshit, we only had the herbs, mija. Why didn't you ask me? Abuela Lopez knew what plants to use, the temperature at which to sip the tea, how many cups for how many days, how long the cramps would curl Alicia's insides, and to what extent she should expect, the ten expect tenderness in her breasts. And so I really like that because it goes back to the whole idea of the remedies mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. it's like a very cultural thing here. Yeah. Um, but then I also liked at the very bottom of the page when they're, when Alicia and Michael are um, spray painting. Mm -hmm. And just the way that this passion she has for it kind of overtakes her when she's um, designing. Yeah. And then it's, so it says, Alicia did countless designs for work, but when it came to trains, some unknowable engine drove her hands. On more than one occasion, in more than one dirt lot, Alicia experienced the feeling of seeing her signature appear as if she had uncovered it beneath the dirty metal. And it's kind of like, for me, it was more like, um, this is how she finds herself. Like she loses herself in the painting mm -hmm. rather than doing it just for work. And just the idea of street art is, is an interesting counterpoint to that gentrification that I had mentioned about the that the narrator, you know, describes, right? That multi-million dollar condos. And so it's kind of almost an act of resistance, you know, an act of protest, the the idea of um of of, of spray painting. Mm -hmm. Um so that so that you know um so that leaves us with our last story of the collection, uh, Ghost Sickness. Um, so this is um, about a a woman, you know, in, in college, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, what did you like about this one? Well, I like that she's in college. Something I can relate to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I also didn't do very good in history classes. Mm. So <laughs> that also was a mm -hmm. way that I related to it. Um. And the way that history is being taught is very interesting too. I think. Mm. Um, what what was there a passage around the two hundreds that you liked? Um, yes. So on page two hundred two, okay. the very last part of the bottom of the page. Yeah. Um, so. She, tells her mom. Anna tells her mom um, that she's been struggling in this history class. And so one day Anna stays with her mom and her mom brings or shows her this purse. And it, so I'm going to read the passage. <laughs> Clifton once told me this purse depicts the emergence, the place where a people crawled out of the earth. It's down south near the San Juan Mountains. Anna examines the purse. It has four mountains in white, blue, yellow, and black. She rubs her fingers over the center. A row of beads loosens. You come from this land, Hita. Remembering that might help you with your little history class. So the history class is, um, I think, about the history of the American West. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so she's kind of emphasizing, like, this, these are your people. Like, you should know about them. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was really 
strong and powerful as well. Yeah. And just um, the imagery of the purse. Sorry. No, no, go the, ahead. Yeah, the imagery of the purse. It, I think it's very depictive of that culture also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, the, the, the memories, right, that are sparked here of, of uh, her great-grandfather uh, Desiderio, right, mm-hmm. her great-grandpa Desi, as he's called here. Um, and then in the following page, it, it does talk about the, the where the title of the story comes from. Yes. You know, ghost sickness. And um, the, the professor here, Brown, describes it as a culture-bound syndrome of the Navajo and other southwestern tribes. And then Anna jots down that, you know, imaginary illness comes after abrupt, violent death of a loved one, marked by loss of appetite, sense of fear, extreme cases, and extreme cases, uh, hallucinations. Um, so just, uh, of course, something we've seen before, right? So th- this kind of ghost sickness is something that has plagued, you know, a lot of characters in this whole collection, mm. I think, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and um, at the... On 204, I just had, you know, where uh, Brown here um, um, just says, uh, for the reminder of class, Brown lectures, answers appropriate questions, and shakes her head. Uh, no, not quite. When a um, pr- rural student compares the Cliff Dwellings of Mesa Verde to the grandeur of Notre Dame. And I just thought that was really interesting in terms of... Um, you know, beauty and the natural beauty of, of Mesa Verde versus something that is, uh, you know, an artificial construction of Notre Dame. And uh, kind of reminds me of, you know, um, recently, of course, Notre Dame had burned down mm-hmm. partially. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of people, you know, on social media made it a point that, well, why is it that all of a sudden, you know, people have money for uh, rebuilding this, this, um, this church and uh, cathedral and, um, you know, but when it comes to other causes that aren't, you know, emblematic, emblematic of, of Western culture, you know, they they don't have that same kind of impetus. Mm-hmm. Um, so it kind of it reminded me of that. Um, and I and then I think you, Vanessa, had the the ending right with Clifton. Yes. Yeah. So what happens here? Um. Yeah. So he's telling her. Um, a story to calm her down. Mm-hmm. And so it says, um, Anna, soundless and peaceful, listened in such a way that she knew she'd remember every word for all her life. And that, he said when they were finished, is this is our story of everything. And I think that's such a powerful line. Um, it's also the last line in the book. Um, and I think that's such a strong way to end it because... This book is about like the different the different generations, all of the the culture of these people. And so and it's from like the perspective of someone like this. Mm-hmm. So I think it kind of just wraps it up nicely. Yeah. And it's 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 beautiful too also because of um the beautiful closure that it's the end of the, of, the, of our collection. Mm-hmm. But the story itself is the story of the first man and first woman who were, um, Clifton says, born of stardust and earth, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's a cosmic connection and at the same time a connection back to the ground, you know, that the ground and, the, again, the landscape, mm-hmm. the, the dead, you know, all comes full circle. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so in the end, you know, we get a be- the beginning and, and it's mm-hmm. just a beautiful way to, to wrap up, you know this collection and right. uh, really um, beautiful way of just telling a story about beautiful land and beautiful people mm-hmm. who suffer and are human. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode discussing Sabrina and Karina by Khalid Fajardo Anstein. And if you haven't read it, we hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. Literally Literary is brought to you by the Mellon Foundation through the Humanities Collaborative at EPCC and UTEP. Follow us on Instagram at literallyliterary.ep and on Twitter at literallylitep.